song and dance going on. Time out, first of all. Q sunset. I mean, we're like running around. This Darren is Darren special order that for me. I know. But thank you for making the trip, by the way. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, proper introduction for Kevin Zinger. Uh, he is the soul behind the spade. That's right. Of, of uh, SRH and uh, the soul and soul owner of, uh, of uh, Suburban Noise Records, which we'll get into in a little bit. I kind of like to go back to the beginning early, early on. You grew up in San Diego. Grew up in San Diego. Going all the way back to the beginning, I was about 18 years old living in Mission Beach. My partner, who's still my partner in SRH, was doing a nightclub. And so he was doing a, like a little nightclub up the street. He invited me over there and he said, hey, come check it out. We, uh, a mutual friend uh, was living with him at the time and he was like, come check out my club. And I went and it was cool. It was in a great spot, but there wasn't really that many people there. And he was like, would you be interested in partnering up with me on this club? And I was like, well, you know, First of all, you had to sneak me in to fucking even come the first day because I wasn't even 21. I was 18 or 19 yeah. at the time. And I was like, you know, can you pull it off with the owners? And he was like, yeah, I can pull it off with the owners. And I was like, cool, yeah, I'd totally be into that. Um, but give me like two or three weeks. Let me find like a good band and really try to promote it correctly. So next thing I know, you know, fast forward a couple months later, the club's at full tilt you know, we were jamming 1,200 people in this club every week. You know, this is Who the... Who were some of those early artists? Uh, Kennywise, Sublime, 311, Offspring. I mean, you name it. The, yeah. the, I mean, this was before any of them went on to sell platinum right. records. Right, this is and, like, uh, well, yeah, this late is 80s, 90, early 90s. I was hip to a lot of that music, you know, the no effects and all that stuff through the surf and skate culture because that's where I grew up in. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't like we sat down and came up with a game plan of this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to launch SRH clothing or anything like that. It was just, we were so a part of that culture already. Well, it was, it was it's in a sense, for, and Rush should jump in here, for those that don't know SRH, for those outside that realm, it's a lifestyle brand. It's a lifestyle right. in, the, in the world of, in the way that hip hop would be. That's I right. think that where it's you know, when you talk about whether it's, you know, stoners or surfers or skaters or snowboarders wreaking havoc, it's like that whole lifestyle. And that's the, that's the spade. That's the, the look. So this, but this all blended nicely with what you were doing with music. We started doing these clubs and all of a sudden, you know, I was 18, 19 years old. I was a sponsored surfer at the time. And, you know, we went from doing one night a week to all of a sudden we were doing five or six nights a week. I mean, mm -hmm. I wasn't even old enough to get in the club. Oh, the next thing you know, you know, everything, the, the fun parts of rock and roll, the the girls, the booze, the Drugs, everything that comes. The late I, nights. Yeah, the yeah. late nights, you know, the whole showing up to a contest at Saturday morning at 6 o'clock to surf, you know, when I'm walking out of a club. I just booked my favorite band, yeah. the girls, all the things that come with it waking up at six in the morning to go try to compete to try to get to a final to maybe win 500 and 700 bucks just wasn't that appealing anymore you know right. so eventually what happened was we were doing so many nightclubs and doing so many concerts and we really became like we tagged everything srh and people like i said it was before all these bands became popular but we branded it well enough where people saw SRH Presents and it was a certain thing. You know, I grew up in Southern California. You know, I was born and raised here, so it just, you know, it's just part of my DNA. So people knew that, like, if SRH was throwing a show, the band would fit a certain lane or a certain vibe and there would be, you know, it was just, it was that thing. And eventually, you know, a few years into it, um, well, it wasn't even a few years, probably a year and a half into it, my clothing sponsor at the time dropped me. That was Gotcha Clothing. Long story short, Gotcha dropped me as a sponsor, surfer, and I went to my partner at SRH and I was like, look, I'm going to take the money from doing these nightclubs and I want to start my own clothing line. Mm -hmm. Let's do this, you know? And he was, he gave me the shot at doing the club and the first break and he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it with you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 20 years later, he's still my partner, so that's a good testament to to the SRH thing and, and the, the bond that we've had. But, you know, slowly but surely, we started to take the money that we were making from clubs and investing it into this clothing brand. So as, as artists were starting to brand their own gear, you were just stamping it 
No, we, we started, basically what happened was we were like, I got dropped by Gotcha. I said, let's take the money from the clothing, I mean, I'm sorry, from the from the concerts that were thrown and put it into a clothing company. And we just started by making a couple of t-shirts and a bunch of hats, found an embroidery company and made a bunch of stuff. And we started handing it out to like, you know, our friends who were pro skaters, bands. And the next thing you know, there was the name this, out there. Yeah, yeah, we were just getting the name out there. And we all of a sudden we had this huge like sort of cult following in Southern California, you know? I mean, everybody from I mean, you name it back then, all the bands were rocking it, right? Yeah. And it was it was uh, it was a special time period for music and Southern California lifestyle. And, you know, we didn't have any big investors. We didn't have anything. I mean, it was so grassroots that, I mean, I can remember when we did our first cut and sew piece. It was, I took a flannel that I liked Mm -hmm. and a pair of shorts that I liked. And I took it to a sew house and I was like, okay, this is what I want changed. And we cut it all out. And I I made the templates. And then I literally, I drove to downtown L.A., to yeah. go get the to go get the material. Yeah. I brought rolls of uh, flannel and rolls of denim. Yeah. And I brought it back to the sew house. I went I went on the uh, fake it till you make it uh, program and just tried to <laughs> figure it out along the way. When did suburban noise come out of all that? Basically what happened was was we were we started doing um, so many shows and the clothing company started doing really, really well around 94, 95 um, and what we would do is Interscope came to us and we put out our first compilation. Interscope came to us and was like, you know, they wanted me to I knew somebody over there that was actually running the place at the time. They wanted me to drive up to a meeting for as an A&R source in San Diego and mm-hmm. that whole just I was on the DIY punk rock like, I was like, what? I'm not driving to Hollywood and doing it. But anyways, I went up and did this meeting and they were like, well, you put together a compilation. And on that original compilation, I mean, it was, I mean, it was Offspring, it was Pennywise, it was, it was all the bands that were sort it re- of It's like a who's who of, like, SoCal Rock yeah, in absolutely. that era. Yeah, before it actually blew up, yeah. right? And that was our first record that we ever put out. At that, in the same time period, there was a band called Sprung Monkey from yeah. San Diego. And I was still super good friends with those guys. Um, Sprung Monkey came to me and was like, um, you know, you're one of our better friends. We trust you. You're a good business guy. Will you manage us? And I was like, yeah. I mean, they were, I, I love that band. And mm-hmm. so that was sort of my first entree into the management side of things. Mm-hmm. And that first compilation I did through Interscope was sort of the first entree into actually putting out a record. Um, and then eventually that morphed into Suburban Noise. Cottonmouth Kings was, uh, a Southern California lifestyle band. We put them on all the biggest shows that we had at SRH and basically tried to blow them up through that. And they mm-hmm. ended up getting a deal. And then I partnered up with Brad in 97 on Suburban Lines. How would you describe Cottonmouth Kings? Cottonmouth Kings, I mean, look, like for all the ups and downs that we've had in the last four years, I'm still very proud of what we accomplished. I mean, they, mm-hmm. were, they were a small band that we made huge worldwide name um, and you know what what's happened in the last few years has been an interesting ride for their legacy but they're still a you know they're still a huge part of Southern California subculture for right. sure well we're on it let's talk about it I mean it's uh, for those again kind of bringing in some of the context of what's going on I think I don't think that you can go through 20 years in the music or in the fashion business without some sort of legal interaction <laughs> right some sort of uh, well that was my first one yeah was it uh, yeah tell I want you to kind of explain it how you feel comfortable from your standpoint because for those fans that are out there that know the suburban noise the SRH the, the cotton mouth kings world they know Brad X as being kind of your counterpart to all that but that's not the case anymore that is not the case anymore (laughs) right uh and okay so again you tell the story Uh, uh, but how did it come to be it came to be look when a band has as long as a run as the cottonmouth king and once again i mean i was there from the beginning literally those guys were sleeping on my couch in san diego and Brad and I were, you know, putting money in to make the first records and mm-hmm. all that stuff, basically getting off. But when you go through basically 15 years with somebody, P- 
people change. They just do. You know what I mean? And through the ups and downs of it, um, I hung in there as long as I possibly could, literally. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what we created with... And when I say we, I don't mean just Brad and I. I mean, there were, you know, there were... A lot of the, people involved. A lot of yeah. people involved. Yeah. The, you I know, agree. From people that worked at the in the building to the fans. I mean, we really yeah. built like a whole subculture around this thing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it was it was bigger than it was bigger than any brand or bigger than any band. You know? When we started selling stuff to like Zoomies and Tillies and stuff like that, like can you imagine like walking in there and showing the you know stoners wreaking havoc line yeah. to like corporate people in the in the Midwest? I mean, I would They're say like <laughs> based, because like from a parental standpoint, I would say from like a content standpoint, yeah. from like a, a content you know, lyrical uh, message that was on the same level with Cottonmouth Kings as it was with like gangster rap. Yeah. It's like your parents did not, there were lists of shit that you could not listen to. And those guys and you know, their counterparts were part of that. Oh yeah. All right. So you uh, and Brad, you're battling it out years and years. And mm. uh, yeah, I mean, we were on the what grind. For, we were on the grind for 15 years and Towards the end, I would say probably the last three or four years, you know, we were partners in a business together, and I managed a band, his band, and, um, you know, it, it, when I say it, it was us that created this whole movement, like, I mean, there really was, I mean, you're talking about people with logos tattooed on them, and oh, you know yeah. what I mean, like, it, it was a huge thing, and, and to me, what we set out to create it just towards the end it just didn't feel right and as much as I tried to put it back on track I mean with you know internal fighting and you know when money comes into play things get weird that's just the reality you know mm -hmm. what I mean and for me you know I mean I've, I've, I've got a bad case of ADD so I've, I have multiple businesses and and so you know when anyways long story short when money comes into play things get a little weird towards the end of the run um, I just had enough man it was just like it just didn't feel right anymore. It just what were those like main like differences that you guys really like ground on? Um, well, one was really like we owned a record label together, and and I felt like you know I was doing ninety nine percent of the work with the other bands that were signed to the label. You know what I mean? Okay, and, yeah, and, yeah. and like you know I was in there. You know, I mean Brad probably came in the office twice a year, you know what I mean, so right. I was in there grinding, and that wasn't even my problem, it was like, it was more of like the internal stuff within their own group, you know what I mean, it was like, they had their own drama, yeah, they had their own drama with each other, and it, you know, it was all, I was always trying to be the voice of reason, and trying to show everybody else the other side's perspective, but you can only do that for so long if it's, you know, the definition of insanity, trying to do the same thing over and over again and, you know... Getting the same a, result. Yeah, expecting a different result. Right. So anyways, long story short, I I basically just said, look, I don't want to manage the band anymore. I'm just... Wish everybody the best of luck and resign and blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, we still own the label together. We're still... Um, brothers it just doesn't make sense anymore for me to manage the band you know yeah. it wasn't a monetary thing because obviously you know the band still made money so it wasn't I was just walking away from it as far as me entrenched in your day-to-day -day life as your manager yeah. after 15 years it might be time just, yeah just try to cut be, the cord yeah it might be time to do something <laughs> yeah. different you know yeah um, and long story, he didn't take to it. No, nah, it didn't really work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't at that point. You weren't implying like business wise. No, not you at were all. Just saying from a professional standpoint. Literally, the the literally it was. I let's get together and talk about suburban noise and how to move forward because I still wanted to obviously put out Cottonmouth Kings records and I still wanted to um, be involved in the Cottonmouth Kings business because you know I mean I helped build it for 15 years mm -hmm. I just didn't want to deal with the daily grind minutiae of the internal dramas the and all bands. of those kind of things yeah. you know what I yeah. mean so I just wanted to take a step back um, creatively so I, you guys were like you were did you we, share we, art like hey I'm thinking about this artist I like these guys or was he out of that from an A&R standpoint from an A&R standpoint the last sort of like seven years he didn't play much of a role in the early days he did okay yeah. but um you know he moved far away and um you know he just didn't play a, a really day-to-day -day role in, 
in suburban Orleans. So, so yeah, anyways, long story short, I, I basically resigned as managing the band. Um, I was sitting in my office um, on, I think it was like a Thursday night at like 6 o'clock, and I was like, look, um, we were supposed to get together at 7 for a dinner meeting, right, to discuss how to move forward and discuss what to do. Um, and I don't, I don't know if it was 5 or 6 o'clock, I got a email from him saying, hey, I'm not showing up to dinner, and 15 minutes later... I got a letter from a very powerful uh, law firm threatening to sue me for every other business, including our own shared business. So, I mean, I own, you know, I mean, they went after Battle Axe, another label I own, SRH, my management company. I mean, it was basically like, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, under what grounds? Like, what was the. (laughs) In America, what I've learned is you can sue anybody for anything. You can come up with anything you want. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but was there was there like an umbrella? What, was it uh, he was claiming it was, rights, or he was claiming? It was kind of bizarre because I, we could never really figure that out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it drug on for quite a long time. We could never really figure out like what do you what is your claim here? Like what are you really saying? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he obviously never showed up for the dinner. You know, I reached out, God, a dozen times, just saying like, let's talk it out. Yeah, I mean. The, this is somebody who was my brother. You know yeah. what I mean? I would have done anything for him. Yeah. Like he was yeah, once all lawyers, those guys. Your uh, friendship's off when lawyers get involved. Yeah, and it, but it was weird. Like I just was like, let's just sit down, man to man. Like what? What is this? Like what? You know? And but and the thing is, is when when lawyers get involved, they can really sort of spin things. You know sure. what I mean? And I think he went so down a path that he just couldn't get off that path. If that okay. makes any sense? Yeah. And he couldn't. There was no way to like sit down with me and have a real conversation at that point because I think at some point he realized like this is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no, and I think a lot of people. I think that there's a lot of like legal uh, remorse. You know what I mean? It is kind. Of, it's like the buyer's remorse. It's like you, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm fired up. And then two weeks go down, they were like, wow, I just threw out 15, 20 plus years. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a business deal. Whatever it's like, you just change the course of history and future. Yeah, and for me, like you know, there was there was a, a lot of things that were in play, and the two most important were like, look, we own this business together, right? Like, forget about credit, forget about who did what, forget about all that stuff. Like, you've got a family, the guys all have families, right? Like, mm-hmm. let's get together and figure this thing out, and not just for the business side of things. But also for the legacy, because it's like exactly. that. I mean, the last four years it messes with like, the history. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, I mean it just. I mean it, it was it was such a thing to be proud of, and now it's just like. I mean, I'm still very proud of it, but it just you look back at it, and it's like, uh, you know. What and I mean? and you know, fans don't want to like remember a soap opera, right? You know what I mean? They don't want to remember band drama, label drama, management business they don't want yeah, to and they just want to remember good music at times so it's like well people so, are trying to escape from that exactly. they're not trying to get involved they got their own it, you know what I mean? and like <laughs> yeah and they, you know and and for some reason Brad decided to take a tack where it was very like he was I think he because the case was such crap I think that that's why he made it so public to try to like I, I, I'm once again we haven't literally sat face to face man to man in three years, I've literally tried to do that so many times. So that so that dinner, that whole thing started three years ago, and I know from talking to you, it all wrapped up like a matter of a few months ago, right? Yeah, it wrapped up. Uh, well, that was the crazy thing. It wrapped up in July of last year, but every time we would wrap it up, they would try to say, "Oh no, no, that's not what we wrapped up." I was like, "Yeah, it's in black and white." Like that was the thing. Is like. You know, you get a lawyer and you pay him five hundred bucks an hour. They'll argue that you know. Oh, yeah, they'll they, argue whatever. Yeah, you know. And, the, God, it, it, <laughs> so, so, to, in in layman's terms, if I could, it's basically Brad comes to you and says, "I want this, this, and this," and then obviously you're saying that's not the case, and we well, need no, to. Well, out of principle, look. If I owe somebody a dollar on the other side of the world, I'll get in a plane and go get them their dollar, right? right? But out of principle, if you threaten me with lawsuits and lawyers and all of these, th- what's right is right. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'll spend more money to fight you to come out on the other side right than to just lay out. Like, a lot of people just settle the case, settle the case. Yeah. You know what I mean? But 
that that just wasn't the tack that I was willing to do. As far I'm not just going to give when somebody you know, my, when yeah. you're smart enough to know that you know your pride's not in the way, your ego's not in the way, and what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. Yeah, I mean, and it was was it over you know naming and and copyright and you know mm-hmm. masters. I mean, did it go or was it just the basic black and white of what he wanted versus he basically he wanted money from my other businesses. Yeah. And that had that, nothing to do with suburban noise. Nothing to do. I mean, it was very clear. We made an arrangement. We were business partners in suburban noise. Right. That was it. I owned SRH before I met him. I managed bands before I met him. I had all these things before I met him. We made a deal to put out records together as suburban noise. I mean, it got so stupid. I mean, he sued Madchild from Battle Axe, my partner in Battle Axe yeah, Records. Yeah, he's, he's been over here. Yeah. yeah. Let's just let's just put it this way: you can sue anybody for any but thing in America. It doesn't mean you're going to win and come out on top. That's just yeah, yeah. God bless America. <laughs> right. uh, and look, at the end of the day, I I want them to go reinvent themselves. Go, like I want them to go be successful. Yeah. Go go do your thing. Like uh, it. it, it yeah. It only became me against them because they made it that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. all I wanted to do was just move on with my life, which I did three years ago as soon as that letter showed up. You right. know what I mean? Like, I was heartbroken. I was bummed out. I was questioning, like, who my friends were. All of those kind of things oh, that anybody that. goes yeah. through. But yeah. but looking back at it now, it was, it was a valuable life lesson, right? Mm-hmm. And... I'm past it. Like, I moved on with my life. Like, mm-hmm. I've got so much other things going. That's so in my rearview mirror. I will go be successful. Yeah. Go, like, for the legacy of you, everything that we all built, the fans, the band, the people that worked on it, I hope they go on and be successful and can sort of smudge out this sort of hiccup in the road. Yeah, that I mean, I think everything, I, and I, you know, I think everything blows over. Um, so let's get into other stuff, Kevin Zinger. By the way, I just was thinking, is Adela, show this little uh, setup right here, this little table. This was where I did a year ago, about a year ago, my first show. Right? So this is like this is like my one year anniversary. Speaking of uh, anniversaries, uh, I had Mikkel from the Airborne Toxic event. I had one camera sitting on a tripod. That's set one. This is set two. Set two. <laughs> what do you think? I want to ask you about a little bit about like music and artists, and you take. Some of these bands that we just rattled off earlier, Unwritten Law, Pennywise, Offspring, names that have like etched in stone and like SoCal music lore. What do you think it is about them? Because their sound doesn't really change, but what do you think it is about them that keeps them around? And and not just them, but like just a, a strong brand in general. I think I, I really think that like with all the bands that you mentioned, like they built up like real core audiences that were fans and part of it and that will always stand the test of time you know what I mean like, you, think a, you think a strong fan base is more than smack like yes. a, a rash of for smash the, singles yes for the long term right yeah. because you know you can write one great song for the moment and that's all it is it's one great song for the moment but if you write a great record that stands the test of time you're going to have fans for the rest of your life yep and you're and I mean, that's it, what and, I've done my whole career is well, I've I tried say. to you know like a lot of people it's weird because like in the clothing business people know me as the music guy in the music business people know me as the clothing guy and right because like, I've been in both worlds you know right. what I mean but you know for me it's like I try to find things that like like I just I like building businesses whether that's a band or a brand or whatever it is I like seeing the process things. of yeah, that, how like it develops develops and, it's like you yeah. know like it's like you know, being I don't the idea guy. yeah, yeah. It, there's there's sort of the long haul in the music business. And what I always tell people, like, you know, it, when a band's going in to make a record, I'm like, look, you can go in there and you can sit all day long trying to come up with a hit, but you can't contrive a hit song, right? Like, or you can't contrive, like, um, clearly you can contrive a hit song. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, take that, yeah, yeah. I take that earlier statement back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, so, you can't contrive... Where's the I, pop I, charts? I, 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 I'll hit, show yeah, you the list. A hit song that stands the test of time. Yeah. Right? So it's like those... Few of those a the, year come out. Right. And the you ones know? that stand the test of time, and all those ones come naturally, right? Yeah. So it's just, make. don't try to make a record for anybody but yourself and just make the best record that you want and you think your fans want and yeah. somewhere in there that's what makes 
great music and what stands the test of time. Well, where do you... Okay, so we've... You know, your evolution of uh, Suburban Noise and SRH 20 years in. Like, do you want this? Do you see this extending into, like, 40 years? Do you want to, like... You know, be the guy that takes a phone call for five minutes and answers twenty questions, <laughs> in, in you know twenty years from now, while somebody runs your company, or do you want to? What do you want to do? I mean, I, th- I, I, th- I struggle with that all the time because you know I've, I've been doing this since I was eighteen years old, so I've yeah. been doing it for twenty plus years. And, you know, I'm a, I work very hard. I pride myself on outworking most of the people in this town and I put in 12 hour days and all that good stuff but it's just part of my DNA and it's 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 rat it's it's a great feeling when you get to see something come to life like right now you know like with the battle axe thing that Mad Child and I are working on like you know like we put this we put this thing out obviously Mad Child had a huge career with swollen members but you know didn't really never really did a solo record and we never really did that and just started experimenting it with it four years ago and and now he's got this whole movement and this whole lifestyle built around it and 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 he's definitely a visionary um and he ran his own business for a long time with his own label um and he understands that you know he needs people like myself and the team around him to sort of like get that vision out to the world and and really uh, make it bigger than, than what he can do on his own and, and he's done a great job and, and it's exciting to see that whole thing blossom into what it, it's becoming you know mm-hmm. and I think we're really really right on the sort of the the front end of, of what the possibilities are with Battle Axe but I mean you know our, the management company I mean we work with I mean such a diverse group of you know not only managers but artists it's you know we manage everything from you know Black Uhuru to uh, Pancho Sanchez, uh, Latin Grammy uh, jazz to rock bands to hip hop groups, dirt bikes, di- yeah. yeah, dilated people. But you to, also work with like the action sport. Are you oh, still act- doing some of that? Yeah, I still do a bit of that. I manage um, Risk, who's like you know uh, one of the most famous graffiti writers out there in the world, but a, a fine artist. So getting into the art world. I mean, just all over the place. Yeah. Slane, who does, you know, acting, uh, acting and, yeah. to music, to everything in between. So, those, you know, I I truly enjoy what I do every day, and I enjoy the people that I work with. So, to answer the question, do I see myself doing this for another 20 years? Probably not, but another 10? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, and now you got the film on tap. Yeah. That film sounds... Yeah. You were just telling me the other night. Can yeah. you give a little rundown? Yeah, it's it's a movie. You're filming based, the summer. Filming the summer. It's it's loosely based around some th- things and scenarios that happened. So I handed it to some people I trusted to to read the script, and they, you know they're honest people, so they would tell me if it was shit. And they all came back to me, and they were like, "No, man, it's good." I yeah. Was like, all right, I might have yeah. something here. So once that happened, I started putting it out to. Um, you know, a few sort of industry people to give it a read, and it's sort of taken on a life of its own. And now, you know, I've got a, a bunch of different people in in town trying to w- want to make it bigger, and you know, this talk to this distributor, this studio, blah blah blah. But to be honest with you, I think I'm just, you know, I've done everything myself for this long. I think I'm just yeah. going to fund it and do it. I don't want people changing the storyline it's got a very tragic ending oop I just gave away the ending but <laughs> <laughs> it's got kind of sort of tragic ending so yeah. I, don't, I, I don't want it to be like oh and then they go the off the butler the did it yeah <laughs> it's, I, I'm, I can't ma- I've never done anything corny and cliche so I do, yeah. or at least I don't think I have but I don't want to well, start I'm av- now I'm available for the extra role yeah. so when you, when, you uh, when you need the film right um, tough of- guy number six Derek <laughs> yeah, Rose exactly. <laughs> in the back um, <laughs> yeah. A uh, couple of things I want to talk about before I let you uh, take the cruise on back up to Malibu. Uh, your dad does some really interesting stuff. My dad is the man. Your dad is a uh, fascinating character. My dad is I the think man. We he's, all... he's, he's, he's probably part of the reason why I, I, I guess I'm motivated. But yeah, my dad is uh, he's 73 years old. He swims three miles a day. 
Mm-hmm. And how long has he been keeping that up for oh, years? Oh, for ages. Yeah, he did like... This is in the ocean. This isn't like going no, out of the yeah, line. Yeah, no, no. He's yeah. not swimming back and forth in laps and pools. I mean, he did. He was the oldest guy to ever do the Alcatraz swim. And that's this. literally they jump off the Alcatraz and swim across the San Francisco Bay. And yep. he did it with... No fins, no wetsuit, no anything. He was the oldest guy to ever do it. Yeah, Yeah. and you know, hundreds of people jump in the water to try to make it, and literally, you know, a dozen or so make it across. And he was one of the guys that made it. So, yeah. I mean, he rides Harleys. He's 73. I'm like, dude, you got to get rid of the Harley. Like, but I think one of the things that's worth mentioning is, is, is he harnesses the power of hypnosis. Yeah, yeah. Which I've always been fascinated by. That's what he, that's what he, you know, nowadays hypnosis doesn't have sort of like that stigma that it did when he first got kind into of like it. But like, he was like kind of like yeah, new wave. People hippie. kind of rolled their eyes when, yeah. you, when you said hypnosis in the '80s and you know even in the '90s. But now, like people have re- and and all hypnosis is is is, is just your. But this is different. But this is different than like going to like a bachelor party and yeah, you're like yeah, Elvis. No, 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 he's not like, doing that. Yeah. He would go into like, you know bigger corporations and stuff like that and basically using hypnosis to sort of like enhance your daily routine enhance your basically enhance everything in your life from your relationships to your workflow to everything so when I was seven years old my dad hypnotized me this is a true story he I got the pictures to prove it and he basically I was seven years old he made me flat like this, and he put my head on one chair, nothing underneath me here, and my feet on the other chair like that. And I was basically like that, right? Frankie. And then the, and everybody in the crowd is like, whoa, how do you do that? And then my dad literally got up and stood in the middle of me. No. Yeah. Had you guys done that before? No. <laughs> and we haven't done it since. So he you just had faith in the fact that... Yeah. I mean, he was working with me when I was younger, and, and I've, I've been exposed to hypnosis for a long time, but... Yeah, he was just like, you know, you're very acceptable to it. Because you, in hypnosis, like, when you see these, like, horny things, like, you you know, like, oh, jump around like a chicken. Like, the person knows they're jumping around like a chicken. It's not like... You think so? Okay. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. People know what they're doing. It's not just like, oh, I'm under some spell or something like that, right? It's just, you're just more open to suggestion. You know, it's like, it's the story of, like, you know... The, Mass the, mentality. No, no, like, uh, you know, you hear those stories about the grandma who picks the car off the kid or something yes, like that. Like, right. You're able to do these things when the, when your adrenaline is flowing and your mindset is right and all of those kind of things. And that's what hypnosis, hypnosis gets you into the state to be able to do those things. It's cool. It's deep <laughs> shit. You like that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> My dad is the man, for sure. He's, he is. He's, uh, he's an interesting character. Uh, well, let's wrap up on... Uh, on radio, I mean, I, I, that's how we met, and that's how, like, uh, I know that that's one of the things that has evolved probably the most since, I mean, we're about the same age, and kind of coming up, listening to the radio, and, like, when the CDs came out, or remember, like, we've kind of lived in that era, we're the last of that generation that's lived in that era, I've seen, like, vinyl, cassettes, CDs, MP3s, now, shit, you know, I remember 8-track. <laughs> yeah, and, and now, you know, shit in the cloud. So it's yeah. like, what do you think, I don't know, like, I, do you I feel think, like... I don't think radio is going anywhere. No, I no, no, think, I don't think, I, and I didn't mean like, I meant more like, in terms of, um, for you as a company that's been around, basically, when, with the same brand, the same idealism since before all that, like, what do you think like is that magic secret sauce to be able to battle through all those changes everything that I've done in the music business if we got radio was just the cherry on top right, right. or the, the extra little something but we've never I've never sat down with any band and said okay this is the radio smash we're going to radio and we're going you know, yeah. it's just not really in, right. you, you have to have everything else and then if you get radio that's great on the on the, f- the format itself I think radio is actually getting a bit better to be honest with you like I think like in the last and I, I don't mean like necessarily um, you know normal terrestrial radio but like in the last decade you know with with Sirius and podcasts and all those things like it's there's well, just and- more ways to like access different voices you know what yeah. I mean it's not the same sort of 
just program thing. But, I mean, I encouraged the, the people that I worked with. I said, let's just switch it up. Like, after you're set, go out there. Go hang out with them. And that's what builds the sense of community. Yeah. So I think that applies in media as well. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, earlier I talked more about the suburban noise drama than I've talked about in three years. And that's because you there's a trust that they're, that's there. You're a good interviewer. You know what I mean? It's like, right. and people like... Joe Rogan. I mean, Howard Stern in the early days, that's what he was great at. You know what I yeah. mean? I mean, he still is. I just don't listen to him anymore, but I'm sure he's great at it. But he can pull things out of people, yeah. and people appreciate that honesty. People appreciate that insight and that, yeah. you know what I mean? So, I, I mean, I can remember when the Napster thing happened, and yeah. everybody was you know, freaking out. It was the end of the... I got into the music business right when Napster was happening. And then, like, you know, that was... Supposedly before that were, like, the glory days of the music right. business where, you you know, you, everybody made tons of money and it was this big glamorous thing. But I did it because I loved music, right? So when the Napster thing happened, it was like... Great. I was like, the, what do you... There's nothing I can do about that, so embrace it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you And you to, were probably downloading as many songs as I was. <laughs> you know, it was like... And, and it and was, you, and you learned about how many new artists, and you know what oh, I mean. Oh yeah. And my thing was always like, and I tried to say that to, you know, people back then was like, you know, if they don't buy the CD, they're they're, they're going to buy a concert ticket, they're going to buy a, a t-shirt, t-shirt they're gonna, exactly. They're going to tell a friend. Yeah. It's, I mean, the whole three sixty deal that's out there right now. I mean, I was doing the three sixty deal before that phrase even came up, and it was and it was not because like I I consider myself. A visionary or anything like that. It was like I could do a better job at making merch for my band than a merch company could. I could get my bands on the road right. just as easy as you know what I mean. So it was well, just I like think, so. I just I, did it all. Rhyme Series is a great boutique, perfect example of a, a well-run label. And I mean, those dudes aren't even in. They're not in Hollywood. They're not in New York. They're exactly. In, they're in fucking Minnesota. Exactly. Travis, who's a good friend of mine who runs Strange Music, Tech Nine, all that stuff. I mean, he's in Kansas City. You yeah. know what I mean. So the so the internet has definitely made the world smaller, and it's give, given people that true ability to take their entrepreneurial spirit and apply it to the entertainment world. So that applies not only to labels, but radio, media. There, there's no way ten years ago, twenty years ago, I could sit here and go, "I'm going to make a movie this summer," because the lines of distribution were just cut off. It right. was either make money in the theater and sell DVDs, right? So if you didn't make money in the theaters or DVDs, your movie wasn't going to come out. Nobody was going to fund it, or nobody was even going to put it out. Now there's Netflix, and oh, I mean, there's Amazon. so many ways to get content out there, and. Yeah. Good stuff always comes up. It's you know what I mean. It's like there's That's good stuff. Cr- the cream always rises to the top, or whatever cliche saying you want to do. But the internet has definitely made the world smaller, and it's empowered entrepreneurs to be able to put out good content. Yeah. So you got SRH.com, Suburban Noise, all the Suburban Noise Records.com, SRH.com, Scratch and Sniff, Battle Axe Records. Regime Inc. for the management company. You can pause and rewind it and yeah. get all those down. Or just, <laughs> just go start a company and put out good content. Exactly. <laughs> Listen to what he does. Thanks, Darren Rose, Music Network. Thank you. It's fun, man. Cool. It's great. Good I shit. I wasn't going to take my sunglasses off mid interview. No, I know. You got to.